Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our year-end tax planning and tax legislative update. Uh, my name is Art Wiederman. I'm a dental division director at I Bailey. I'm located in Southern California in the city of Tustin. And my good friend and partner in crime, uh, Mr. Mel Schwartz. Good morning, Mel. Good morning, Art. How are you today? I'm good. How's life? Uh, what are they doing in Washington today? Are they doing anything? Oh, they are trying to absorb the thousand pages that uh, uh, the Senate Finance Committee dropped on us uh, uh, about five o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Nice. Uh, as near as we can tell, it doesn't include that much new information, but uh, we'll, we'll cover that when we get to that part of the program. We will get to that. Okay, so Stacy, if you could uh, advance the slide. So that's us. Uh, um, I'm the dental, and go back one. Uh, Mel is uh, Director of Tax Legislative Affairs. So Mel, tell everybody a little bit about what you do with I Bailey, maybe? Well, my role with I Bailey is to keep track of the uh, the sausage factory here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, I think I'm assigned to Minneapolis. I have a Minneapolis area code. I don't live in Minneapolis. Um, the background that you see behind me is uh, uh, that was taken about uh, two months ago uh, on the uh, uh, on the shores of the uh, uh, Totman Cove uh, in Maine. But the uh, uh, my goal is to keep I Bailey, keep I Bailey professionals, keep I Bailey particularly, keep I Bailey clients informed of what is happening in the sausage factory. Uh, because what they're talking about, particularly, I, I think, is apropos for this session, because there are going to be some changes as to how we plan, as to how we plan year end. Particularly, there are likely to be some changes as to the plans we make going forward. Uh, and uh, we're going to cover those today and uh, certainly want to make sure that any questions you have about how that uh, is progressing, the tax legislation, uh, is now in the Senate uh, and uh, is progressing. Uh, any questions you have about that, we get an opportunity to, to answer those directly. Okay, so let's go ahead and Stacy, advance the slides. Uh, next slide, please. So if you guys have an opportunity, I do a semi every other week podcast. I've now just entered my fourth year of doing it. Um, it's called the Art of Dental Finance and Management. We talk about uh, all kinds of topics. We talk about uh, this stuff, tax stuff. We talk about uh, practice management. Uh, I just recorded one last night to start, you know, how you should start off 2021 and your uh, 2022 with your financial plans. Mel has been a guest on my podcast. And as soon, Mel, as uh, the sausage, fa I love that, the sausage factory. Uh, as soon as the sausage factory decides to generate some uh, legislation for President Biden to sign, and he signs it, you will come on a podcast with me, and we will talk about the new laws. But today, we're going to tell you the up-to-date information. So if you want to sign up and subscribe, uh, there's the information, uh, and uh, I hope you'll listen. We have thousands of listeners uh, every week who listen to the podcast. So next slide, please, Stacy. So here's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to give you about five to 10 minutes updates on PPP forgiveness, the employee retention tax credit and the HHS provider relief fund. It doesn't have anything to do, well, it kind of has something to do with taxes, but this is important information for all of you to know. Uh, Mel is going to then uh, talk in great detail about the pending new tax legislation, the thousand pages of stuff that came out and what Mr. Manchin is doing and all that kind of stuff. And then we're gonna get into some specifics for the dental profession. Uh, we're gonna talk about equipment purchases, retirement plans, cars, capital gains, employing your, um, you know, employing your, your, your kids, your mom, your grandma, your goldfish, whatever you wanna do here, and then deductions. And then we'll call it a, a day. We should have you out of here. I'm hoping in an hour and a half to two hours, no, no more than that. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so let me kind of, because, you know, PPP, ERC, HHS, it's all very confusing. It's alphabet soup. We all know that. So everybody got, most of our dentists got two loans, two PPP loans. The first one you would have received somewhere in April or May of 2020. The second one, if you applied, and most of our doctors did, you would have received somewhere in the neighborhood of January through 
March, April of 2021. So you've already filed for your round one forgiveness. If you haven't, the bank is going to have you start paying it back. They would have already done it because you're past the 10 month period. Uh, so for round two, just general overview, the same time frames apply. You can choose an eight to 24 week period. Uh, most of you should choose a 24 week period. Uh, you, have, uh, you have that period, 24 weeks. And then after that, you have 10 months after that period to file for forgiveness, which will put most of you into the first quarter of 2022. So you're gonna be coming up here in the next th two to five months. So you wanna watch those dates. Remember, take 24 weeks after the date you got your loan, unless you've already filed for, for I mean, uh, uh, unless you wanna choose a, a shorter period and then 10 months after uh, 10 months after that. And you have to meet all the program rules, folks. Uh, most everybody is just filing saying this is free money but you had to make sure you use 60% of the money for payroll, 40% uh, for the other allowable expenses. You have to have basically the same number of full-time equivalent employees and you had, cannot have reduced salaries or hourly wages by more than 25%. We're not going down that road today. Just be sure you know that you have to follow the program rules. Next slide, please. So um, on December 27th, uh, Congress basically passed uh, and I don't remember if it was the second or the third stimulus. Um, the former President Trump signed that on December 27th, which basically allowed dentists and all business owners who had a PPP loan to apply for the employee retention tax credit. That tax credit was not allowed when the CARES Act was passed in March of 2020 if you applied for a PPP loan. And we told everybody that PPP was better than the ERTC. So we passed, they passed that. And then we said, that's great. Now we can apply for this credit, but how does it work? And then on March 1st, they gave us an IRS notice 2021-20, and they gave us 103 pages of rules. And if any of you are having trouble sleeping these days, feel free to read them. It'll put you out in about two seconds. We have done close to 100 in our, just in our office, ERC projects. I Bailey has done hundreds of these for other types of businesses other than dental offices, but we have done about a hundred or more for dentists. We've generated, uh, we're now over three and a quarter million dollars. Um, it's not too late. Uh, even if you have already filed for forgiveness, it's not too late to apply for this credit because you have uh, three years from the date you filed your payroll returns for the second and third and fourth quarter of 2020. So you have till sometime in 2023 to apply for these credits. Um, so this is something that, that we're doing. We're getting calls every single day. Oh, can I do this? Yeah, sure. Send it to us and we'll do a complimentary analysis. Next slide, please. So real quick, if you had a greater than 50% reduction in your revenues, net of patient refunds for the first quarter of uh, second quarter of 2020, when everybody was shut down, versus the second quarter of 2019, you will qualify. Now, if you had a 50% reduction in any other quarter, you qualify, but 99.99% of you will qualify from the second quarter of 2020. Uh, if you had it now, if you had a greater than, and that's for 2020, for 2021, this credit is much more robust. For 2020, it's basically 50% of wages paid to employees up to a maximum of 10,000 in wages. So for example, if you had 10 employees that all made $10,000 in the applicable quarters, that's $100,000, your credit's $50,000. That's a lot of money. That's where the $3.25 million that we have basically come up with uh, came from. I mean, we've gotten really nice credits for people. For 2021, if you had a greater than 20% reduction in revenues, net of patient refunds, either in the fourth quarter of 2020 versus the fourth quarter of 2019, which is called the look back rule, or the first three quarters individually of 2021 versus 2019, um, you will qualify. And the credit for that period is, and that's in the next slide, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, um, is, is significantly more robust. If you want us to look at this for you, we will do a complimentary preliminary analysis. Just email me and there's my email address a Wiederman at idbailey.com. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
So if you do believe that you qualify for the 2021 ERTC, you should not file for forgiveness yet. Let us figure out the interplay because we have had people who have filed for forgiveness for round one and it did cost them some money in this credit, some a lot of money. And here's the way it works for 2021. If you qualify, it's per quarter. 70% of the wage is paid up to a maximum of 10,000 per employee, which could generate a maximum credit of $7,000. Now, if you paid an employee $3,000, you know, it's, it's 70% of $3,000 instead of 10,000, but the max is 10,000. And again, that's compared to 50% of the wages paid uh, up to a maximum of 10,000 per year for the entire year of 2020. So folks, if you haven't looked at this, you should look at it. It's free government money. And it's, again, we, we've gotten a lot of people. Now, I will tell you, and, and Mel can chime in on this, um, the IRS is somewhere between four and eight months behind in processing paper tax returns, Mel. I would say eight, eight, we're, we're not even seeing the eight month yeah. uh, being met in certain circumstances, primarily when we're filing uh, amended returns. But, and, uh, but that amended return, as you said, Art, <clears throat> we've got three years to go back and pick this money up. Uh, are you gonna see a check the next day? No. no. Are you gonna see a check the next month? No, but the check will eventually come. Now we have heard that, that people who have, see we when we did this, we waited until this notice came out. And what happened was, is we got going on this and figured it out. And, um, we created some very sophisticated spreadsheets here at I Bailey to do these calculations. And so most of the folks that, that we took care of here in our office in Tustin and our dental group across the Western United States, um, we got these filed July, August, September, October. So I would suspect that our clients, because they're all calling and everybody's calling, some of our clients are on this webinar and they're saying, when am I gonna get my money? And I, I said, you know, just, just call Joe Biden, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, <laughs> D.C., right? And, and he'll tell you. But um, uh, I would hope in the first quarter of 2020, 2022, I would hope um, some people are getting some of their refunds and stuff like that. So, all right, uh, Stacey, so, so that's where we're at with the, the update on that. Let's talk about now the HHS. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a big deal, and you want to take some notes on this. So many of you, as part of the CARES Act, they created the PPP, they created the Employee Retention Tax Credit, and they also created, created the HHH, the HHS, the Provider Relief Fund. I do numbers much better than I do letters. The HHS Provider Relief Fund. That was $175 billion that was part of the $3.2 trillion CARES Act passed in March of 2020. And that was intended to provide healthcare providers money to, um, to fight COVID. And it was only for healthcare providers. So what happened was, is they started doling this money out to hospitals and critical care nursing units and nursing homes and physicians uh, on April 10th of 2020. But they really didn't know how to do this with the dentists. And I've been in very close contact with Megan Mortimer, who's the congressional lobbyist for the American Dental Association. And she and I were talking about this. And finally, around June, July, Megan says they figured it out. So what they did is they, they went on to the records that they had from tax filings for all of you. And they said, we're going to pay you. We're going to look at your 2018 or 2019 tax return. I want to pay you 2% of your gross receipts for that year. So if you had a million dollar practice, you got $20,000. If you had a $6 million practice, uh, you got $120,000. So our doctors started getting this money. Uh, that was what was called phase two. Then in phase three, which came out uh, at the end of 2020, the government's intention was for you to get eight, up to eight, replace 88% of your lost revenues. So you, for those of you that applied for phase three, you put down your gross revenues by quarter, and some of you called, called us up and said, oh my God, Art, I just got $137,000. Can I keep it? 
Well, we're going to talk about that, not today, just in, in brief detail here. So now you don't get money without having to do some work, okay? They were going to have you report this last year. Uh, I'm sorry, earlier this year. Bottom line is they couldn't get their act together. So now for any of you, this is very, very important, who received over $10,000 between July 1 and December 31, whether it's phase two or phase three, you must register, which you can do now on the portal, and you have to report on the web, on the portal of the Department of Health and Human Services between January 1 and March 31 of 2022. You can register now, but you can't do this early. They won't let you on the portal until New Year's Day, uh, which is about, you know, almost about three weeks away. So we recommend that you start gathering the information required by this now so you're prepared uh, for January 1st. If you don't report on the portal, this is in capital letters, by March 31, uh, you're going to have to return the money. If you have questions, there is a website. Um, uh, there's an email that you can go to, which is prf at idbailey.com, and uh, we'll help you with that. Next slide, please. So again, uh, first reporting period ended on September 30th, uh, but that's not gonna apply to most of the dentists unless you got more than $10,000 before uh, June 30th. Now, they gave everybody, they gave the, the medical practitioners uh, until November 30th, they gave a 60 day extension. So we have a weekly meeting um, headed up by our two partners, uh, Tyler and Ashley, and we were informed at that point that one of their clients on December 1, the day after the reporting period ended, tried to go on to report. They were locked out by HHS and, came, and what came on the screen was, you have not met the reporting requirement, you need to pay your money back. Very clear. So folks, you need to do this reporting. You need to do it. And by the way, don't do it. Don't just go on and start doing it. There's a lot of information you have to gather. Next slide, please, Stacy. So we're doing a webinar, January 21, 2022, from 9 to 11. That is a Friday. Uh, Tyler Bernier, Ashley Brandt, Duda, and myself will be doing this webinar. We're going to walk you through page by page, step by step, of what to gather and how to do this. Okay? Uh, there is a small charge. It's a lot of work to put this together. Um, and so... We are in the process of building out our landing page here at iBailey. For those of you who have attended our webinars, you know that you go to the link and you register. So we'll have that done shortly. If you are interested in attending this webinar, please send me an email. I don't have a landing page yet at awiederman at iBailey.com so that we can make sure that you get the link on time. All right, next slide, please. All right, Mr. Schwarz, you're up. So Stacy, if you would turn the control over uh, to the slides to Mel. Mel is now gonna talk about the Build Back Better legislation and where we are now. In, and, and, and folks, I'm gonna tell you one of the great things about being a part of this incredible CPA firm that, that, that Mel and I work for is that we have access to information before the rest of the world. This is because of Mel. So Mel, what are they doing? Well, they're working on it, Art. Uh, yep. They are working on it uh, as we speak. As uh, we speak. As we speak. Well, no, because most of them, I think, actually went home for the weekend. So <laughs> they uh, uh, they may be uh, uh, there may be a meeting down at the uh, um, down at the Admirals Club at uh, at National Airport. We're not sure. Uh, maybe they can share a cab on the way home. I, I didn't get my invitation, by the way. <laughs> Let's uh, let, let's. Uh, I think this this picture says really everything that is going on. We have uh, the infrastructure bill. Uh, they were able to pass. The president has signed it, but now uh, there is a real bottleneck, and that bottleneck. Note that the the donkey is associated with the bottleneck there. <laughs> uh, this is all. Keep in mind, guys. This is a no Republican is involved in this uh, legislation. This is democratic only legislation because the uh, Democrats only have 50 in the Senate. Now they can break the tie 
uh, with the vice president. But because they only have 50, essentially every Democratic senator is a king or a queen. And they are in a position to say, well, if I don't play along, you can't pass your bill. So you need to play along with what I want. Now, of course, the problem is they want different things. Some of them want uh, things to be smaller. Uh, right now, the, the, the legislation that was passed over from the House is about a $1.75 trillion package. Now, most of that is on the spending side. Uh, there is uh, a few tax benefits in there. Mostly it is tax increases uh, in order to offset the cost of some of the social programs that are intended to be, uh, be passed through. Uh, in particular, uh, Senator Manchin from West Virginia and Senator Sinema from Arizona have raised a number of questions about, well, I take that back. Let's not even say they've raised questions. <laughs> they have made the statement that they are not, they want to see a smaller bill. They want to see fewer tax increases. And uh, they are particular about the kind of tax increases that they see. Uh, we do not yet have any sort of final word from either Senator Manchin or Senator Sinema. Uh, as to what it's going to be uh, be accepted. Now, uh, what we'll do here is the timeline. Okay, uh, well, this actually goes back a little bit. Uh, the original plan, if you go back into really the late spring of this year, uh, the idea was that they would have what they call a pre-conference bill. Conference in Washington, the Congress is where the House has one piece of legislation, the Senate has a different version of that legislation. They appoint a limited number of uh, House members and a limited number of senators to sit down and come up with a compromise between the two bills. And that is called the conference. Uh, the idea here was, well, let's sit down beforehand and work through and develop the bill, and then we'll just pass it. Well, that did not come about. <laughs> uh, it sort of came about with regard to, to infrastructure because the Senate came up with a package, essentially told the House you can take it uh, or leave it. Uh, the House groused about it and took about four months to deal with it, uh, but ultimately just took what the Senate had sent over. Now, the House has gone first this time, and we go on November 19, they passed their version of the piece of the Build Back Better bill, uh, which is going to be handled through reconciliation. Reconciliation is a special set of rules in the United States Senate that will allow the Democrats to take this legislation to the floor, to pass it, and send it to the president, if they can get the House to agree, uh, without any Republican votes at all. Okay, we've got the House version that came over November 19th. Uh, since November 19th, the Senate has been trying to figure out, okay, can we accept this? No, the answer is clearly no. They're not going to accept the House version. Pre-conferencing, it was a failure. Uh, so the House is, the Senate is in the process of determining what changes it's going to make. Uh, and that process is taking a, a long time. Uh, Majority Leader Schumer, a uh, senator from New York, uh, announced that he intended to take up the uh, legislation this week. Uh, that looks somewhat questionable at this time. Uh, we don't know where agreements are going to come with regard to some very specific areas, uh, a number of which are going to affect you as, uh, as dentists. Uh, really, you as independent businessmen, I think, is, is probably the better way, way to put it. But the goal would be to finish by Christmas. And uh, a number of us are concerned that that means we're going to be watching this uh, on Christmas Eve and somewhere under the Christmas tree, 
We'll try and figure out what they ultimately put in the legislation. Okay. Finishing in the Senate is not the same thing as finishing the legislation. Nope. So if the Senate finishes by Christmas, does the House come? The House could come back and simply accept what the Senate does. The House could come back and say, no, we cannot accept what the Senate does. In which case we enter into essentially a game of congressional ping pong, which could push the completion of this legislation into sometime in the first couple of months of 2022. It still appears more likely than not that legislation is going to be enacted. Uh, but there is a material chance that this whole thing could fall apart. And the scheduling, pushing everything to the end of the year uh, is, is certainly part of that. Now, what, do, what does the activity in the Senate really mean for, for taxes? Uh, we're just going to focus on the, on the tax piece here. Uh, the Senate is likely to insist on a smaller bill. Uh, I think that certainly the 1.75 trillion is the high water mark. Uh, we could easily see that reduced. Now, less spending means less needs for tax to offset that spending. And so that possibly, that raises the possibility that some of the provisions could either be scaled back uh, or maybe some could be dropped it entirely. Hey, uh, hey, Mel. Yeah. Mel, so, so one of the things we were talking about before we came on uh, under the middle slide up here, uh, I saw this this morning. I thought it was very interesting. So they said that, uh, you know, it would cost $367 billion over 10 years. But one of the things that I think is, a, is an issue is that if some of these or all of these provisions, not only the tax provisions, but all the provisions in here become permanent, there was a chart up there that Senator Lindsey Graham was talking about in a news conference that said it could cost $4 trillion. How does yes. that all work? Well, most of the provisions, well, first of all, <laughs> there's special rules under reconciliation, one of which is you can only affect, your legislation can only affect the 10-year budget period. So in fact, because it's under reconciliation, at the end of 10 years, the earth will open up, the legislation will disappear into the earth and be covered over and, we will, and, and will be known no more. And this is exactly what happened in 2001 with the Bush tax cuts. This was exactly what happened in 2017 with the uh, Trump tax cuts. Uh, most of these provisions are in, do not have a 10 year life, uh, particularly on the spending side, they may have a, some of even only have a one or two year life. They will have to be addressed again. Uh, and new legislation will have to be enacted that would extend them for that full 10 year period. Now, uh, I think most people believe that uh, the Democrats will not control both the House and the Senate after the next election. It's, uh, it's a possibility. They may, and, you know, certainly that's, that, that, that seems a reasonable possibility, uh, just given history, if, if nothing else. Uh, so, yes, I, I think it is important that we have that kind of number. That says, you know, if you made these permanent, this is this is what it would mean. Uh, but by no means does this legislation make these things permanent. Yeah. Uh, and my guess is that a number of them would not be extended, particularly uh, in the context of a uh, uh, situation where the Republicans once again became players in the game. Yeah, I, I mean, they have they have 2022 to get something done. If they lose even one of the two houses of Congress, it's going to become very difficult for the Democrats to get their agenda. So they've got they've got control. It's the same thing as it was when President Trump was elected. He had this. It was the same deal. He had the the they had the the Republicans had the White House, the House, and the Senate, and they had that you know. And then 
boom. So it's it's a political cycle, basically. It's a political cycle, and they pushed things through. And again, most of their provisions had to expire after 10 years. Uh, and in fact, what we see in this legislation is the <clears throat> early expiration <laughs> of some of those provisions. Although there are a couple of ones where that were determined to be good ideas that are being uh, be extended. Uh, really, uh, the whole question of how much does this cost factors into how much taxes are going to be raised as a result of the legislation. And uh, I think Senator Graham's, uh, our, 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 yeah, Senator Graham's uh, poster is very informative. It is not going to determine how much taxes are going to be raised in this legislation. It may suggest new taxes will be needed farther in the future if you're going to continue all the provisions, but that's a decision that's going to have to be made uh, farther along. Uh, there is some concern that because the CBO, which is the official scorekeeper in Washington, uh, has, has determined that the bill that the Senate, the House sent over to the Senate is not revenue neutral. It's $367 billion short. Oh, excuse me, I must have touched the, touched the wrong button here. Uh, it's uh, $367 billion short. Uh, if you're gonna hit revenue neutrality, then that means we may need more tax increases. Uh, the feeling is that the Democrats are simply going to stand up and say, CBA is wrong. CBO is not giving us sufficient or maybe any, any credit for the additional uh, money that we're going to fund to the IRS to chase after billionaires. Uh, and uh, so we simply... Our, our, our somewhat rosier scenario gets us to zero. We're sorry that the CBO didn't agree with that rosy scenario, but uh, we're just going to move forward. Uh, I think that leaves us really with uh, some very key uh, hot button issues. The greatest one of these is how are they going to handle the limitation, the current limitation on the ability to deduct state and local taxes uh, on, uh, on your Schedule A. And uh, right now, the House sent over a version that said, uh, you can deduct up, instead of the $10,000 limit we have now, make it an $80,000 limit. And that would be effective for 2021 and for the next nine years after that 10-year provision. Uh, that probably is the high water mark for this one. Uh, there are various versions that are being debated. Uh, it's interesting that the Senate Finance Committee released uh, uh, a document uh, on Saturday afternoon that covered, uh, sent, made, made some, a few changes with respect to the uh, uh, with respect to the version that had come over from the House, with regard to this SALT provision, it simply said placeholder. And so I think we can say with relative certainty uh, that we don't have a deal. Uh, there have been discussions based on the idea that uh, you would have unlimited ability to deduct SALT taxes, but only if your adjusted gross income is between four hundred and five hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. Reports are that there are members in the House, Democratic members in the House, that could scuttle this bill if that's all that we get. So I think there is a uh, certainly a good reason to hope that that will be a more generous provision. Uh, there may be a dollar cap on how much you can deduct, certainly a lot more than 10,000. There likely is to be a AGI cap on how rich, how much money you can make uh, and take advantage of the change. Uh, but again, the feeling is it's likely to be 
uh, higher than this four hundred to five hundred and fifty thousand. So, so Mel, I want to I want to jump in and let's talk about a little planning we can do. If 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 I remember correctly, when the um, uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed, I want to say that former President Trump signed it on December twenty second of twenty seventeen, if I remember correctly, or something like that. So we had a week, uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's, to do with it. Mm -hmm. We could have that happen again. So for people, uh, for, for our dentists who are listening, the, my thought would be that if you are going to have, and again, we don't know whether this is going to be 400 to 550, whether it's going to be unlimited. We, we just don't know yet because they've still got some more horse trading to do in the sausage factory. But if you, in my thought would be, folks, if you have a significant amount of state income tax you're going to owe from some event you sold a piece of property, you sold your dental practice, uh, you took a large distribution from a retirement plan, something like that. Uh, you had a large capital gains. So like here in California, it doesn't matter capital gains. It's, it's treated as ordinary income as it is in many states. So if you're gonna have a large income item and a large tax liability this year, but then next year, you're not gonna have a large state tax Mel, maybe they may, maybe they watch the news and they 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 pay this before the end of the year because I don't know. I mean, we'll have to see. You have to watch the news and see what they say. The great thing about state tax is you can go onto most state um, websites, like here in California, the Franchise Tax Board website, and you can pay your taxes online and you get immediate credit and a confirmation. So. What about that for tax planning? I mean, it, it, it's it's really hard for us to determine. It's it's terribly hard. And I think it's, unfortunately, it's going to have to be something. Remember, we talked about, uh, Schumer's talking about passing this through the Senate on Christmas. Yeah. So that means it's got to go to the, uh, is the House going to do this New Year's Eve? If you have funds available, if you, if you are liquid, <laughs> or you can get liquid uh, and you can watch how the legislation develops, then uh, there may be advantages to going to I mean, the traditional approach would be to go ahead. Uh, it, it certainly, if we get greater ability to deduct in 2021, get that money in January 30 or excuse me, December 31. Uh, if we don't get that, if we still do not know where we're going to end up, uh, an early payment, I think, is uh, uh, not necessarily where you want to be. Right. But it, it, yeah. it's, having, it's having that flexibility. And, you know, unfortunately, it's one where you, the taxpayer, may need to be watching this. We will certainly do everything that we can to get the information to you as soon as it settles. Uh, and, but in the yeah. absence of, but if that's January or December 31, uh, you, you may need to also be following uh, CNN to, to see what's happened. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to be following on December 31, the two national championship college football games. So I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to be watching this or not, but 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 anyway, um, so a couple we'll break things. in at halftime, Art. Exactly. Uh, we're, we're buying some. We're buy, We're going to buy some time and break in at halftime. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. I can tell you, people from Cincinnati, Alabama, Michigan, and Georgia probably aren't going to be caring. No, just kidding. But anyway, the um, uh, so a couple things is uh, they can watch Ide Bailey's website. We're, you're probably put up an article uh, on our YouTube page. Uh, and you and I, depending on when this legislation passes, will, as soon as I can get you on a Teams call, we'll record a podcast and get it published. We'll do everything that we can to get this information out to you. Um, and But again, this is be kind to your CPA year. Uh, you know, if they pass this legislation on the 27th of December, it's not going to be easy. Okay, let's move forward. Okay. A uh, couple of other things that are hot button items, uh, not necessarily that affect the, the, the dental practice, but are going to affect the overall ability to come to an agreement anytime soon. The uh, oil and gas business really gets clobbered in this legislation. Uh, everything from uh, um, the so-called methane tax, 
uh, to uh, returning, uh, re re reinstating the Superfund tax, which was essentially a tax on oil or petroleum-based chemicals. Uh, that may need to be uh, somewhat calmed down. Uh, and uh, there also are a number of favors for friends of the Democratic Party in this legislation. Really? Some of which may be a little too obvious. Uh, the, uh, the deduct, there is a deduction for union dues, above the line deduction for union dues. Uh, it's a small deduction, but uh, it's there above the line nonetheless, uh, meaning you just get it as a deduction. You don't have to put it onto your uh, itemized. It doesn't go on Schedule A, it goes on the front page. Uh, and uh, also, the uh, as currently structured, there are a large number of let's call green energy provisions, and they are intended to be benefits to encourage the use of alternative fuels, alternative production of electricity. One of which is we're going to see uh, credits again, and fairly significant credits for the purchase of a hybrid vehicle, ideally an all electric vehicle, but surprise, 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 uh, you get a much better credit if you buy a union built automobile in the United States <laughs> than if you get that Ferrari that you have been dreaming about when you finally sell your practice. Is there a Ferrari uh, SUV? <laughs> no, there is no Ferrari SUV. Not quite. I saw a I saw a Bentley SUV. There the is a day. Bentley. There is a Jag. You know it. it but the, the Italians seem to be holding the line. The, the right. British. The British. We're done with the British. Uh -huh. uh, but the uh, the, uh, <laughs> the the Italians seem to be holding the line. Some of those simply are going to be sufficiently bad press that they're going to have to be addressed. But you know, friends are friends. Uh, there are a couple of noteworthy changes that have uh, uh, have already gone through, uh, one of which was they were going to start, uh, the House had a tax on e-cigarettes, and that has sort of magically disappeared from the legislation. So if you're uh, sneaking uh, anybody, if, so if you're sneaking out for a vape, uh, we're not going to increase the, we're not going to double the cost of your vape. Uh, through a new tax. Uh, starting point, we've been talking about things that are in the House legislation. That really is the starting point. It, there's not enough time to completely restructure the bill. Uh, in some ways, I think it's important to look at the things that didn't make it into the House bill and are unlikely to be able to come off the table uh, and into the legislation on the Senate side. And probably the most important of that was we would had talked for a great deal of the year about there being increases in the top marginal tax rates, tax increases for corporations, tax increases for individuals that earn more than, that have more than $400,000, increases in the capital gains tax, maybe even eliminating the capital gains differential. Uh, None of those made it into the House bill. Uh, expectation is that they will not make it into the Senate bill. Uh, there were some very significant modifications to the estate and gift rules uh, that essentially were going to require you to redo your estate plan. Uh, those are not there. Uh, step up in basis, that was the big one. That is not in the legislation. Uh, and also most of us, most of you who operate in either a partnership, well, anything other than a true corporate form have been able to enjoy the so-called pass-through deduction, the 199 cap A, 20% uh, uh, so long as you don't make so much money that you have phased yourself out of that range. Uh, lots of discussion about modifying that. None of those modifications made it into the final bill. Well, so, so Mel, you're you're saying that we we're, we're likely to stay at a maximum rate of thirty seven percent. Yes. Wow, that's great. I think that that's I think that that's that's where we are now. That doesn't mean 
<laughs> when they took that away, <laughs> suddenly thou shalt, and thou shalt take it away. That's there all you, all, right? you know, the big print giveth and the little print taketh away. Exactly. In the in the I words of uh, uh, A.J. Calhoun Esquire, uh, here is some of the little print uh, because we're not going to raise tax rates. There needed to be some money raised otherwise. So let's skip over the, the state and local tax for a moment. We talked about that. Uh, on the individual side, there are two significant tax increases. One of which is remember as active participants in a pass-through business, we're not subject to that additional 3.8% that is applied to investment income, that is applied to wage income. Only group that escaped the 3.8% uh, were active participants in a pass-through, in a partnership or an S corporation. That would, that exception would be repealed. So, so here's what that means. That means that if you're a dentist operating as an S corporation partnership, would that also include a sole proprietor, Mel? Also includes a sole proprietor, that's right. Okay, so if you operate and you make $300,000 in your dental practice. So if you're an S corporation, we're gonna talk about this a little later in the webinar. If you, if you make $300,000, you might take 120,000 as salary and have 180,000 drop down to your K-1, uh, which is the way this works. Right now, that $180,000 is not subject to social security tax, and that won't change, but it is also not subject to this 3.8% uh, net investment income tax, but now it will be, is That's if correct. this goes through. So it, they, they're kind of, you know, how we, we want, and we'll talk about this a little later, but uh, this is a big deal. So if you have $180,000, call it 200,000 to 3.8%, that's $7,600 of additional tax you're gonna to have to pay. Um, now, now that said effective after 2021. That's correct. That would be effective okay. beginning in 2022. And sure. there is a phase in of this because remember the president promised no tax increases for those of us who weren't earning $400,000. Uh, we need to talk about my bonus a little later, Art, but uh, that's... Uh, uh, Me too. <laughs> so this is actually phased in. So if, 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 you're a, if, if what you earn is your dental practice, you earn $300,000, you are not going to be subject to this change. That's good. It is when you go over the, for a married couple, over the $500,000 at that point, we'll begin to phase out between 500000 and 600000 this protection from the 3.8% tax. Uh, take a, make it four hundred to five hundred dollars if, to if, if you're single. Right. Keep in mind, that's AGI. That's not just what you earn on your dental practice. That's all the income that is being reported on the joint return. So if the spouse has a job, we're going to count the spouse's income in determining this amount. If you have some capital gains, we're going to include that in this. You have some interest that you've got. Whatever income you have will be included in this calculate, will be included in this yeah. calculation of so, adjusted gross income, uh, subject to you know, a couple of the, the deductions like your, uh, your self-provided medical, uh, things of that nature. But uh, it don't, it's not just, the key is it's not just your dental practice that you're going to need to be aware of here. It's really the entirety of what's going in to the calculation of your gross income, your adjusted gross income, before you get to itemized deductions. So, so if anybody on this call is looking at selling their dental practice, um, if they sell it this year, if it's a sale of a partnership interest or S corp stock, or you know the, the personal goodwill in a dental practice sale is uh, up to interpretation. There was a great tax advisor article about that. Um, 
if you close it this year, you don't pay the 3.8%. If you close it next year, you might pay the 3.8%. That's very much true. Yeah. So these are the things that unfortunately what's going on is what we have to deal with. But, um, uh, but the good news is that for most of our clients, my guess is we might be able to get away from this, but for the doctors that are making, you know, five, more than five, 600,000, uh, this is an issue they're going to have to deal with, but they got to pay for it some way, right? They got to pay for it somewhere. So if they weren't going to increase the 37%, this was the kind of thing. And I, I've got to say, uh, there's some other provisions in here that may or may not survive. This one appears to be pretty well locked in. Okay. I would be very surprised if we see any change in this particular provision. Now, that didn't get them all the revenue that they were giving up by not increasing the top marginal rate. Uh, so the other piece that they pick up is this so-called millionaire's surtax, uh, which is a 5% surcharge. Not a tax, but a surcharge on your adjusted gross income above $10 million. Uh, that may not cover anybody. We hope that covers a few of you. Jeez, we, you know, and the year you sell the practice, again, that might be the year in which this, this is applied. Uh, and then the, again, there's, it goes to 8% uh, on the amount that's above 25 million. Uh, that would have to be a very nice practice, but uh, in any case, again, these are effective after 2021. And if you're going to have that much revenue coming in, then uh, from a sale or from whatever uh, other circumstance, that's one, again, where I think that some of the uh, year-end planning that Art's going to get into uh, will speak highly. Now, right. Uh, I will point out here, uh, $10 million. Okay. You know, many, uh, some of us don't even dream of having a $10 million annual income. Uh, however, the number, the trigger for a estate or a trust is only 200,000 for the first 5% and 500,000 for the next batch. And this is what may require some changes with respect to your succession planning, to your estate planning. Uh, generally, it can be handled by making sure that you have distributions out of the estate or trust, uh, but it will be, if this goes through, uh, and I think there's a good chance that it will go through, then this is certainly something that um, you want to uh, make sure that you have not in your will somehow locked in your estate and accidentally made them subject to this surcharge. I mean, the, the bottom line is if you have a, a, a trust either set up now or that is set up uh, through uh, estate documents, most people pass through the income to the beneficiaries of the trust or the estate what we're saying, and, and the government really penalizes you if you accumulate money inside of a trust. I mean, once you get to, what is it, 10,000 of income now? Yeah, you're, you're at the top, at top marginal rate, right. Yeah, so, so you don't want to be accumulating money inside of an estate or a trust. So if you have one where it's accumulated, you might want to check with your estate attorney or your, your CPA. Um, and, you know, we can help you with that too. So that's... Uh... So that, those are those are some here's some other provisions uh, that are included. Uh, if uh, you were in corporate form and hope to be able to use the uh, Section 1202 small business small corporate uh, uh, exclusion, uh, there they would do away with the special 75 and 100 percent exclusion rates. The 50,000, the 50 percent would still be there. Again, there's a an AGI trigger. Note that this one does not is not effective beginning in 2022. This one they made effective as of the date that they introduced the legislation in the House Ways and Means Committee. 
Uh, so it is already, or it, if enacted, it will already be in effect, effect for sales and exchanges after September 13, 2021. Uh, for those, there's some special rules with regard to extremely high value uh, IRAs, uh, particularly in situations where you take uh, very large qualified plans and attempt to roll them into a Roth IRA. This is a pretty specialized item. It mostly we're seeing mostly we see this applicable in uh, corporate situations, large corporate situations where there may be uh, some extraordinary bonuses. There may be some extraordinary stock gains. Uh, this is uh, this is the Romney provision. Uh, Senator Romney uh, had a very, very efficient uh, tax deferral technique through a series of IRAs. Uh, this almost uses his tax return as a model for what they would no longer uh, allow. Uh, one thing to, a couple of things to note on the positive side. Uh, if you provide childcare or then the amount of that, uh, again, this is going to begin in 2022, but the provision would increase uh, your child care credit to 50% of the qualified expenditures subject to a $500,000 cap, uh, overall cap. And uh, so if that is a uh, item that you are currently providing, if that is an item that you know, perhaps would make a difference in retaining uh, some of the technicians that you would very much like to retain on your payroll, uh, but have children. Uh, that is something that the, at least for the moment, uh, the government is intending to uh, to help pay for. So, so if you have an extra operatory uh, treatment room you're not using, turn it into a child care facility is what you're saying, Bill? Yeah, uh, that, oh. that is, uh, but you know, you don't have, it doesn't have to be on site. Uh, right. The key is you provide the child, you provide assistance for the child care. And that then gives you a, uh, a credit uh, equal to uh, half. Now is going to be pretty much half of what you pay, you provide for that child care. So the right. government goes 50 50 with you in right. providing that benefit to your employee. Well, I'll tell you what, my children are adults. They can they can care for themselves. Let's move on. <laughs> that does not That's describe theory, all though. of our, that does not describe all of our viewers, Art. I understand. And and, and again, terrible. this is I'm sorry. If the government wants to help pay for something, <laughs> maybe we ought to let them. Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, lots of credit opportunities uh, in the green energy area. These are primarily going to be structured as investment partnerships. Uh, you, I'm sure, uh, because uh, promoters love to send things to dentists, uh, I am sure you will be inundated with some of these. Uh, some of them will make sense. Some of them will not. Uh, art is always available to uh, look through and tell you whether this makes sense or not, uh, makes financial sense or not. Uh, but there are going to be some opportunities out there to generate some credits uh, that could affect current uh, tax liability. Uh, and, you know, depending upon how they're structured, uh, may be the technique that you use to bring your adjusted gross income underneath some of these trigger amounts that we've right. been talking about. So, uh, again, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to rush out. The, the promoters will come to you. But uh, <laughs> there are, assuming that the legislation moves forward. And as I said, uh, if you are in the market for a uh, uh, in the in the market for a hybrid car, uh, there are going to be some generous credits. It appears, uh, particularly if you can find a union-built one in the United States. Um, could this whole thing collapse? Yes, we've pushed everything up against the end of the year. Uh, the uh, poll numbers, uh, popularity of the president is not what it was at the beginning of the year. 
uh, that has, I think, emboldened some Democratic members to step away and say, I'm not necessarily going to support the president's proposals uh, if I feel that they do not uh, properly reflect the needs of, of my district or of my state. Uh, betting here in Washington is, I would say, still 70-30 in favor of legislation ultimately being enacted may not be by January 1, but ultimately being enacted. But 30% is a material chance that this whole thing blows over. And mm -hmm. where we end up, if that is the case, uh, is a real, real question. Uh, it's taken them this long to get close to putting together the uh, coalition that they need, coalition of interest that they need. It would be very difficult if they had to start from scratch, particularly now, in you, an election year. Let me yes, ask sir. you a question. So about the like the salt deduction, which is something Yo. that a lot of our dentists are going to be very interested in. And by the way, the salt is not only your state income tax, but it's your real estate tax. Indeed. So, so if you get to the point, most of you would be able to prepay your April real estate tax. If this legislation passes and you're under the limit, there's another opportunity there. But let's say they pass this legislation by January or February, do you think there's a chance they could make it retroactive to 2021? If they do it within, if they do it in January, I think there is a good chance that they will go ahead and just make it retroactive to 2021. They've right. made retroactive provisions before, they know how to do it. Uh, it has been challenged in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has upheld their ability to do retroactive provisions. Uh, so I think that if they do it in January, that it is um, likely that they would stick with the 1-1-2022 effective date, which is what we see on most of these provisions. If this should slide past January, I, that begins, I think, to be much more problematic. Um, the anticipation is that uh, if they do slide past December 31 to enact this, we should see some sort of relief with regard to estimated taxes, the estimated taxes that are due January 15, uh, probably the catch up taxes that are due on April 15. Uh, that will be left in the hands of the Internal Revenue Service, but there will be enormous pressure on the IRS to provide some relief well, there. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the problems with pushing this thing to the end of the year. And it is possible that whatever the Senate does, the House is just going to come back and rubber stamp. Uh, and that would give us enactment. Uh, we can get it, you know, we take, he'll take, we'll, wherever he's spending his Christmas break, they'll fly the, 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 uh, the, the bill down to him and he can sign. Uh, but again, it may be, it may be halftime of the Michigan game. So, uh, <laughs> well, good luck with that. Um, one more thing before we, we move on to some other stuff, Mel, is my understanding is there's also $80 billion in this to beef up the IRS. What's that all going to mean? Well, that is, <clears throat> that's the source of some of the debate over the, uh, uh, whether this is revenue neutral or not. Most of that money is intended for additional uh, compliance, additional audits uh, to be focused primarily on larger corporations, to be focused primarily on very wealthy individuals. Uh, the uh, expectation is that, you know, if, if you're around the $400,000 line that we've been talking about, that is not going to significantly increase the audit rate at those levels. Okay. Uh, they're going. They're they're going to go where the money. Like the like uh, uh, the, the old saying is, uh, "Why do you rob the bank?" Well, that's where the money is. Why do you audit rich people? That's where, that's where the, the money point. is. Uh, and so uh, that's what that is intended to do. Uh, whether they can effectively implement that additional money is 
very much subject to question, but uh, I think that is going to be uh, a part of the uh, of the provision. And in fact, when we uh, uh, when the Senate Finance Committee dropped the uh, its thousand page uh, tome uh, as we were coming back from our golf dates on Saturday afternoon, uh, the uh, they actually had increased the numbers that went uh, to enforcement, uh, as well as increase the numbers that went to uh, essentially putting the IRS in a better position to answer the phone. Uh, I think that is, if you really get down to it, uh, there is a belief that if they answer, if, the more they answer the phone, the fewer mistakes they're going to be on smaller returns and they're not going to get to the audit the smaller returns in any greater rate anyway. So, Good. <laughs> in fact, if you want if you want to raise money in that area, giving people advice as to how to fill out the return is by far the best way to collect the dough. Uh, in any case, uh, but no money for a, a new computer system. So everything's still going to be on it. Remember those the, the tapes that you'd see in the uh, the computer banks, like maybe in the 1960s James Bond movies, we still use those, and they're stored in a salt mine somewhere uh, in West Virginia. I can't believe it. All right. <laughs> All right, Mr. Mel, that, that's great. Um, you, you're on top of it as you usually are. So um, are you are, you have more on this? Or I believe gonna... that I am. Uh, oh. No, nope, I believe it's now, going to be your turn. So I'm now going to it's my turn. The, so hand so the PowerPoint Stacey, back if over. You would, if you would please take the controls for me, and we'll start here. So we're going to walk through the things that you should be doing right now uh, to save some money. So first, let's figure out how do we figure out your taxable income and your tax. So the way this works in the thirty-five thousand foot view is we start with your gross income. There is a lot more, but these are the big ones your wages from your dental practice and other sources. If your uh, spouse uh, works uh, somewhere outside the dental profession, that's counted. Interest and dividends, capital gains, your net income from your sole proprietorship, your partnership K-1 or your S corporation K-1. Unemployment, uh, which we had was a big deal in 2020, not as much in 2021. Social security income and your money that you receive from IRAs and qualified retirement plans. So we start with that. We subtract adjustments to income, IRA contributions, uh, non-corporate retirement plans, health savings accounts. Um, we subtract that and we get to what's called adjusted gross income, which is some of the things, which is, this, which is this, the, um, the place that Mel was talking about. You get some of these uh, thresholds on is adjusted gross income. That's how the child tax credit is computed, adjusted gross income. Next slide, please, Stacy. Next slide, please. Stacy. Uh, Stacy, can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, I'm trying. Oh, One sorry. Sec. Sorry, That's okay. my bad. I was, and then I was trying to unmute myself and <laughs> talk at the same time. So let's see. This is live TV, folks. This is what <laughs> happens. So. I was um, not wanting to, to go next. Oh, dear. There we go. Okay, is that here we it? go. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank sorry. you. So. Then after our adjusted gross income, we have what's called our itemized deductions or the standard deduction. Medical expenses that exceed seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income. Uh, the SALT deduction, state in income, real and personal property tax. Again, limited to 10,000 per year, but maybe not for long as we've discussed. Home mortgage interest, investment interest. Like if, for example, if you have margin uh, interest on your investment accounts. Uh, and charitable contributions. So we take all those off the top, of, off the adjusted gross income. Next slide, please, Stacy. And then we have this section 199A deduction, which is what we talked about here, um, which is what they're going to talk about if your income is over five or 600,000, that it might phase out. But for now, it's 20% of your income from partnership, S corporations, rental properties that meet certain rules. Um, so doctors, if your uh, adjusted gross income is over about $330,000 
and then that phases out at 430,000. If it's over 430,000, you will not be able to get this deduction. If your adjusted gross income is under 330,000, you will get this deduction. It's 20%. So like we said before, say you have a, a, an S corporation, uh, your net income that you pay tax on is $300,000. 100,000 is in a W-2, 200,000 is in a K-1. Your deduction is $40,000, 20% of that. We're gonna talk a little more about that. So it phases out at 429,800, and these numbers are half of that for single individuals. So uh, the idea is we wanna get your adjusted gross income down to a point where we can take advantage of this deduction. Next slide, please. So. Dr. Weed, here's another example I, I drew up here. I operate my dental practice. I made 500,000 in the practice. I took a $400,000 salary and I showed a net income of 100,000 on my K-1. I have itemized deductions of $50,000. So my taxable income before my 199A deduction is $450,000. Since I'm a dentist and I'm classified as what's called a special, specified services trade or business, and my taxable income of 450 is over the threshold of 429.8, I get no deduction for the 199A. Next slide, please. So what do we do if we make some changes in the way we get paid here? Uh, I'm only required to take what's a reasonable salary for a dentist. I've been an expert witness in court cases, uh, in, in dental litigation where I've had to testify and I get information from the ADA in Chicago as to what a reasonable salary for a dentist is. And in my mind, 150 to 200 thousand dollars would stand up in most any place uh, that I would testify or in front of the IRS. So what if we change my salary from 100, 400 thousand to 150? So my K1 is 350 thousand dollars. Okay. So since my taxable income is 450,000 and I don't qualify for this 20% deduction, we can do some stuff. Next slide, Stacy. Maybe I buy before and place in service a CBCT machine that costs 125,000, okay? Or I set up a retirement plan that allows a contribution um, and you know, $50,000 or I make a charitable donation of $50,000. If I can get my taxable income under $329,800 by doing one of these things, okay, um, taxable income drops. My 199A deduction goes from zero to 20% of $225,000, which is where I ended up after I did, I bought my CVCT machine. So that's going to save me at maybe a 35% tax bracket, $15,750 in tax. So we, when we work with our clients using this 199A deduction, we generally don't put everything to salary. We generally put it to, um, you know, a, a reasonable amount to salary and the rest to a K-1. This is just something that you need to be looking at. Uh, probably not a whole lot you can do about it for 2021, but there is something you can do about it for 2022 notwithstanding, then we get into the 3.8% tax that they may or may not add. So, but just, this is what we do for some of our clients. Next slide, please, Stacy. So here are the tax rates, folks. So basically we are in, uh, there's effective and marginal rates. If you say, well, I'm in a 50% tax rate. The, the items on your left here are the tax rates you're in. The tax rates go from 10% to 37%. And these are taxable incomes for 2021. So if your taxable income is over $647,851, every additional dollar that you earn is going to be taxed at 37%. But the first $647,850 is taxed a little bit at 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, and 35%. And your effective rate is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 20, 18 to 22% is my experience. So for example, if you had 300,000 taxable income, you are in that 24% tax rate and you put 40,000 into a retirement plan, you're gonna be taxable income at 260. So you're still in that 24% tax rate. So if you put $40,000 in, you're in that 24% rate of between 178, 151, and 340, 100. 
you save 24% of $9,600 plus your state tax. That's how this works. So when we as, as tax planners do things for our clients, we're looking at marginal rates. If you're in a 10% or 12% bracket this year, for whatever reason, we may not want to go buy that CBCT machine this year. We may want to buy it three and a half weeks from now when maybe we're going to be back in that 32, 35% rate, et cetera. Okay. Next slide, please, Stacy. All right. So Art and Mel, how do we save taxes in 2021? Let's, let's figure this out. Next slide, please. Number one way that a dentist can do this is equipment purchases. We still have, Mel, I think, 100% bonus depreciation. That's not changing, right? I don't think that's going to yes, change. Yes, we do. That's, that, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so we still have that. So that means that any equipment that you buy, and it must be placed in service. I have gotten three questions in the last three weeks. Art, if I make a down payment on a, a, on a, a digital x-ray or CBCT or a new operatory of equipment, can I take that right off? No, you cannot. It must be placed in service. Placed in service in the regulations is defined as um, in a state of readiness, which means that if you get a piece of equipment installed in your office at halftime of the, of the Alabama-Cincinnati game, you need to take a picture and show that that chair goes up and down and date stamp that, that it was placed in service. You don't have to pay for it. You could buy 100,000 of equipment get it placed in service on December 31, your first payment is not until next year and you're good. Now for, Cal for our folks listening to this webinar in California, that's a different conversation because we're limited, there is no bonus depreciation in California and in many states. So you need to check with your CPA uh, on what your state does. And in California, you're limited to 25,000 in section 179. The most important takeaway from this that you must do is to check with your CPA. You don't have, this is as technical as I'm gonna to get today, folks. You need to make sure that you have sufficient tax basis in your S corporation to take the deduction. Uh, if you're a partner in a partnership or an LLC or a sole proprietor, if you have debt that you're liable for, you have basis. In an S corporation, you do not. Next slide, please, Stacy. Here's an example. I grossed a million in my dental practice in 2021, net profit of 300,000. My tax basis at the end of 2020 was zero. I took salary of 120, I took distributions of 180,000, which brings my tax basis at the end of the year to zero. I go and buy a CBCT machine for 120,000, place it in service on December 20th, and I take a bank loan, okay? Since I have 300,000 to my basis for income that I added to, I started with zero and it's reduced by my salary and my uh, S corporation distributions, I have a zero basis at the end of 2021. Next slide, please. That basically means that I do not get a deduction for this year. So if your equipment rep tells you oh, just make the down payment, go get a bank loan, it's no problem, you, that doesn't work. The way you can get that deduction would be if you took personal money and made a capital contribution to your S corporation of $120,000, you then have basis in your S corporation to write off that purchase. Very, very important. So the big takeaway is if you're looking at buying equipment, and by the way, I've had some conversations with some Shine and Patterson Benko supply reps. Uh, some of the stuff is available, some of it is not. We have supply, supply chain issues in this country, folks, if you haven't seen. So if you can get this equipment installed, you need to just check with your CPA. If I do it this way, if I get a loan, do I have basis? You might have basis. You might have $500,000 in your operating account and you have basis and then you're fine, but you need to check. Next, next slide, please, Stacy. All right, retirement plans. We're gonna, we're gonna compartmentalize a two hour lecture into about five to 10 minutes. If you have a retirement plan, uh, my legacy in 37 years of dental, in, in being a dental CPA is to say, you need to fund your retirement. 
Uh, I just recorded a podcast last night talking about how much money you need for retirement, how you should for 2022, if you don't have a retirement plan, start one. If you do have one, make sure you're funding it to the maximum. If you are able to fund 30 to 35,000 a year, you wanna have a simple IRA, okay? Uh, it's, it's easy, that's how much you can put away. And that's the first thing you have to determine folks is how much can you afford? If 30 to 35, maybe 40,000 is all you can afford, that's the simple IRA. Very, very important point. If you have a simple IRA right now in your practice and your practice is doing really well and you think you want to step to the next level, which is the profit sharing plan, you must stop funding your simple IRA on December 31st. You can fund for the last payroll, but you cannot put anything away for 2022 because once you make one contribution to a simple IRA, you are precluded from having any other type of a retirement plan for 2022. So the next one is what most of my doctors have, which is a profit sharing plan with a 401k component. So you can fund up to $58,000 plus $6,500 if you're over the age of 50 to a retirement plan. And if you put your spouse on payroll and you do a 401k for your spouse, 19,500 in wages can be paid to your spouse, 26,000 if the spouse is over 50, and you're probably looking at funding five to 15,000 for your employees, and you would have administrative fees for the IRS and Department of Labor and Compliance. So for those of my doctors that can do anywhere from say 40 to 100,000 a year in retirement, the profit sharing plan is what you wanna do. Again, if you have the simple IRA, and you want to go to the next step of profit sharing in 2022, don't do your simple IRA. Get rid of your simple IRA, set up the profit sharing plan for 2022 and fund to that. If you are 40 to 45, and we've actually seen it done for folks 35-ish, and you have 100 to 400,000 or more that you can fund, um, the defined benefit pension plan is a huge deduction. It'll do a lot of things for you. It'll bring you under $400,000 for the child tax credit. It'll bring you under um, for the um, section 199A deduction. It will cut your taxes because if you have that kind of money to put away, you're probably in a 37% bracket and state could be 10, 12. California, the highest state bracket is 13.3% folks. So it gets kind of hairy there. So. Number two way to do this, make sure you maximally fund your retirement plan. If you don't have one, you can set one up before the end of the year. You better call your administrators quickly. You cannot set up a simple IRA now because you had to have done that by October 1st, but you can set up a profit sharing or defined benefit before the end of the year. I will tell you that the administrators that I am working with, that Mel is working with, are buried. They have no time. So you, if you're going to do this, uh, maybe, well, wait another half hour till we're done, but then, you know, go ahead and do it then. Next slide, please. So again, if you don't have a plan, set it up by December 31. Uh, you have until the due date of your tax returns, including extensions to make the contribution. If you're going to fund the pension contribution with next year's profits, I go back to the same thing. Check with your CPA and make sure you have S corporation basis to do this. Uh, the contributions are fully tax deductible. Earnings on the amounts are tax deferred. Uh, most of you will save 30 to 45, maybe more percent by putting this money away. Uh, and again, we talked about the basis issue. Next slide, please. Automobiles, my favorite subject. If you purchase a car that is under 6,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, you can take depreciation um, for 20, um, uh, you can take depreciation for 2021 of $10,200, plus you can take up to $8,000 of bonus depreciation. That has to be multiplied by the, um, uh, that has to be multiplied by the percentage of business use. So if you use your car 80% for business, that would be $14,560. If your car is over 60%, ground vehicle weight, uh, ground vehicle weight rating. And that can be found on the owner's manual and on the driver's front door. You can take 100% bonus depreciation on the whole thing. 
If you're audited by taxing authorities, you're going to have to justify business percentage. Uh, it should be over 50% to get you the maximum benefit. So next slide. Uh, buying versus leasing a car. If you buy a car, you get the depreciation deduction each year, which is the bonus depreciation and the uh, annual depreciation uh, that you're allowed. If you lease the car, you will only get the monthly lease payments, both based on your business use percentage. I have owned four automobiles in 41 years. Four automobiles in 41 years, folks. Uh, I am one who believes that you buy a car, you maintain it, and you don't have a $1,000 a month uh, car payment, and the car gets me from point A to point B. My wife uh, told me that she wanted me to get my car payment. I said, fine, go find out how much that would be. And I said, and they came back with a, a $6,000 price. I said, it's okay. I'll keep the car the way it is. I'll wash it every once in a while, but I'm going to keep this car for a while. If you don't drive a ton of miles and you always want the newest model every two to three years, you should probably lease. Buying will give you a larger deduction, faster write-off than leasing, unless you're leasing a really, really expensive car. Uh, really, exactly. And uh, Stacy uh, popped in, and I want to remind everybody that if you want a copy of the PowerPoint slides, uh, the handout link was posted in the chat function at the beginning of the webinar and you can get them from there. I think they'll be posted in a couple of days or something. Next slide, Stacy. So this is a great one. This is my favorite. So um, I was out at a client um, in 2018, 2019. They had a sale event, so they wanted a big write-off. So they bought a $180,000 over 6,000 pound car and wrote off 80%. We went and had our meeting with this client about 45 days ago. And he says, Art, I have a problem. I was offered $300,000 to sell this car to somebody else. And they wanted to do it before the end of the year. So Mel, is that a good investment return on a car? 180 to 300 in about two years? You know, any, any positive return on a car is a good return <laughs> exactly. on a car. This, this, this is incredible. This is so, absolutely incredible. But but this is, I mean, this is, it's crazy. It, it happened to be one of these, it was a Mercedes. They looked like a, a, a tank. It's their, I don't know what they call it, but anyway, that's an annualized investment return of 166% in two years. And I don't even think the growth in Apple or Tesla stock could have topped that. Um, that I just put that up for entertainment value. Um, and we all know how hard it is to lease cars, to, to buy cars, to get rental cars. Um, so, you know, what can I tell you? Next slide, please. Okay, children on the payroll. This is a really cool thing that you can do before the end of the year. Under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, what they did is they reduced the standard, they increased standard deduction significantly. So for 2021, if you're a single individual, the standard deduction is $12,550. That means that if you put your child or an elderly parent or grandparent on the payroll of the dental, dental practice, they can earn up to $12,550 without paying any federal income tax. So you would need to make sure that that uh, child, grandchild, goldfish, whoever you put on the payroll, right? That they have an employee file, they're paid a fair rate, they're actually doing stuff, marketing, grocery shop, I mean, whatever you guys come up with, okay? There is a very good chance that you'll have to file a state tax return for your child. For example, in California, the standard deduction is only $4,600. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, before I take that, there is a question. Uh, does the bonus depreciation apply in California? No, it does not. There is no bonus depreciation in California whatsoever. So basically, Dr. Wiederman's son, Nathan, who is a uh, uh, graphic artist, he actually is my name of my son, and he is actually is a graphic artist, has been hired to do the practice website and all this kind of cool stuff for the practice. Uh, he's a computer expert. If we can justify that Nathan's services are worth up to $12,550 based on what I would have to pay to another professional, 
we can basically pay him that. Uh, basically, Nathan saves 37% because I get the deduction for the 12,550, all right? And he is not gonna have to pay any tax if he, is, uh, if, if he doesn't have any other income. So that's a way that we can do this uh, again, it reduces your adjusted gross income, it reduces your taxable income, makes you more eligible for the child tax credit, makes you more eligible for the uh, 199A deduction, uh, et cetera. Next slide. And there's please. a, if I can break oh. in. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. There's another twist to this, which is Nathan is not paying any tax, but Nathan has earned income. Yes. So if you, dad, are generously inclined towards Nathan and would <laughs> give gift him some money. This would be an excellent opportunity because I'm sure I assume that Nathan is in his early 20s at the oldest to drop that money that you gift him into a Roth IRA. Yep. He doesn't need the deduction, so we don't need the regular IRA. And now we have stashed away potentially a nice piece of change that will never be subject to tax on its growth. Yep. That, that is, a, <laughs> that is a, a great take on that. Um, and, but yeah, putting your children on payroll is something that you should consider. Now we've had also theories. If you have a baby, how can we do that? Well, uh, I don't think the labor laws allow six month olds to do uh, dental assisting or hygiene. However, what about using your baby as a model on your website or your brochure? And if you went to a modeling agency in Los Angeles or San Francisco or wherever you are, and you uh, basically said, I want to hire a baby to do, be on a brochure, I don't happen to have access to one, they might charge you three, four, five thousand dollars. Who knows? So, just keep in mind that this is an opportunity for you to save some taxes. Next slide, please. Okay, capital gains. Now, Mel had talked about the fact that um, they had had on the table, Mel, I think it was 26.5% at one point they were talking about raising the capital gains rate to. Yes, 26.5% 26, 26 is considered the magic number. That's the number that a combination of encouraging people to go ahead and sell and then collecting uh, an additional amount on the rest raises the most revenue for the feds. Right. So if you sell capital assets, the gain is taxed from anywhere between zero, we'll get to that in a second, to 20% for federal. For most of you, the tax rate is going to be 15% unless you have a huge sale like a real estate sale or a dental practice sale. I think it's once your income gets over about about a half a million dollars for a married couple, that's when it jumps to 20%, give or take. Mm -hmm. So if you've already sold assets at a gain, dental practice, stocks, the market's run up this year, folks. It's, it's been kind of squirrely the last two to four weeks, but it's run up. If you are in a loss position, you have some dogs in there, okay? You can reduce capital gains by recognizing capital losses. So let's say you've uh, you sold your dental practice and you have goodwill of three hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars. You call your investment advisor and you say, "Investment advisor, what can we do here? Do we have anything at a loss?" Oh yeah, well we bought this stock and it we thought it was going to be great, and it not it's not done well and it hasn't come back. But I'd really love to hold it long term because I think it's got some potential. You can sell it now if you sell it and you buy it back within 31 days, that's called a wash sale. And that's gonna eliminate your loss that you're allowed. So you, if you sell it, but you wanna still keep it, you gotta wait 31 plus days to buy it back. There are instances where you can sell capital gains and actually generate a 0% tax rate that requires use of tax projection software, which we and other CPAs use to determine the gain. So that's where you sit down and talk to your CPA. So. Play with capital gains and losses. Next slide. Itemized deductions. Remember we talked about the fact that the standard deduction is uh, right around $25,000 for a married couple. 
So if you have medical expenses that are greater than seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income, it could be a one year out of pocket expenditure that maybe won't happen again. I don't know, because, you know, if your income's, you know, three hundred thousand dollars, you would have to have, um, you know, twenty one, twenty two thousand dollars of expense. But maybe you do. Maybe you had a a, a, a medical procedure that's uh, not covered by insurance uh, and you had to pay out of pocket. So what you want to do, and it's the same with your charitable donations, is you want to bunch your charitable donations and your medical expenses into 2021 or 2022, depending on where you're going to be over the standard deduction. So for example, uh, let's say you have a medical deduction uh, for this year that's, I don't know, $40,000 out of pocket. And that medical deduction, you have some charitable donations. What you want to do is any medical expenses that you're going to have in the first three to six months of the year that you know you're going to have, you want to pay them ahead in 2021 since you're over the standard deduction. I think I have an example on this. And by the way, folks, charitable donations and medical expenses can be charged on a credit card before the end of the year, even though you don't pay off that credit card until 2022 and the deduction is allowed for 2021. Next slide, please. Yeah, so anyway, um, let's see, this one had to do with, okay, so that has to do with stocks and charities. So what you wanna do is you wanna bunch your itemized deductions together so that you make sure that if you have a, a one-year event, either for charity or for medical expenses, that you pay them in the year that you're going to be over 25,000. Because if next year you're going to be under 25,000, maybe your house is paid off. Maybe you give three, four, five thousand to charity. You will get the standard deduction and you won't get any benefit of putting money in. If you're in the standard deduction this year and your, your itemized deductions are maybe 17, 18,000, making an additional charitable contribution at the end of the year is not going to help you. Okay. All right. Donate appreciated stock to charity. Don't sell it and give the money. So Dr. Wiederman here likes fruit. So he buys stocks with the name of a fruit in it. I decided to start with the letter A. So I went with Apple, right? That's a good stock. My Apple stock has a gain of $100,000 since I bought it when Apple came out with their iPhone one back in the 1800s, right? So I sell my stock. Um, I'll pay federal income tax of $30,000, federal and state. So 20% capital gains, federal, probably 10% here in California. Your state will be different if you're not in California. That leaves me $70,000 to donate to charity, okay? If I donate the stock in kind to my favorite charity, as long as I have held that stock for over one year, I will get a full charitable donations deduction of $100,000, okay? So if you're gonna donate stock in kind, you wanna not sell the stock, you wanna donate it in kind to the organization. And I guarantee you, your organizations will be able to take that stock. Okay, next slide, please, Stacy. So that was the standard deduction that we were talking about here, about bunching your deductions. Since you have a limit of 10,000 for state and local income taxes, real estate taxes, home mortgage interest, or rates are historic low you may be at the standard deduction. So you need to look at that. If your deductions right now are maybe $17,000, $18,000, and you're thinking about giving a couple thousand to charity, not going to help you this year, folks. It'll help you on the state, won't help you on the federal. It's $25,001 in 2021. So again, bunch your deductions into years that you're going to be over the standard deduction. Next slide, please. So again, this was uh, this is an example um, that we talked about. I don't have enough medical expenses to get any benefit. I'm at the maximum of 10,000 for state and local income tax. Home interest is 7,000, 3,000 charitables, 20,000, which is below the standard deduction of 25,100. It makes no sense for me to make any additional donations, uh, except to the extent that maybe they would be over $5,100 is what I'll get a benefit for. Bunch the deductions into 2021, maybe a big donation to the dental school uh, of 10,000 this year as you're close to the standard deduction or look at 2022. You've got to run the numbers for that. Next, uh, next slide, please. So um, this is the SALT deduction we talked about. Watch the news in the next 18 days. 
if the House and the Senate and the White House can come to an agreement and they sign this legislation before December 31st, folks, they've done this to us before, trust me. Um, you should consider possibly paying your real estate tax ahead and your state income taxes before the end of the year. This is what we talked about before. Uh, you just kind of have to watch and see what they pass. Watch our I Bailey YouTube page, website. Hopefully we can get a podcast out that this passes before the end of the year. We'll see. Next slide, please. I think that that is about it. Let's see. We got you out of here in uh, about an hour and 45 minutes. Mel, do you have some final? Oh, I have one more question. Okay. Well, I saw, yeah, I saw, oh. there was one question I think that was, was raised, and uh, I think this is a good one, and it deals with the state, uh, state taxes, uh, and it deals with the question of whether or not, and I'm sure this was from a uh, dentist in California, uh, because he asked about the use of AB 150, which is, I understand, is the election to have the state taxes paid at the uh, S corporation level, as opposed to having uh, the income pass through and the tax uh, paid at the uh, uh, at the individual level, and uh, I am not uh, I, at, as to the specifics, California. I think I have to leave those to to you, Art. But it is unfortunate that the states did not get together and come up with a single approach. To this issue because virtually every state has a different way and a different set of positives and negatives to making this election. Uh, and we've seen things that make sense in Colorado make no sense in California. We've seen things that make sense uh, in one state not make sense in other states. Uh, and so at least on a national basis, everything seems to point to yes, generally assuming that we're still going to have the limitation in 2020 uh, of $10,000, which is one of the possibilities that you know we get, we get relief, but the relief doesn't come in until 2021. Uh, you really do have to talk with someone who has specific knowledge of how your states Yes. election works. AB 150 in California, that one, that's your call, Art. Well, uh, that AB 150, <laughs> the Franchise Tax Board has made it virtually impossible for us. I mean, they okay. didn't come out with the forms. We are, we, we've had these conversations. It's what's called a workaround, where you end up paying your state income taxes through your S corporation, you get a deduction on your S corporation return. Uh, there's still some questions about the mechanics of how to do that. There are people that are doing it. Um, but again, for most of our doctors, we have, um, you know, they've already paid in their state taxes through the withholding that we've set up. It's, yeah, you have to check and it's a case by case basis. But you're absolutely right. That is something that they did put in, but they have not made it easy for us, I can tell you. There's one more question that came up here. It said, Art. What's the taxable issue for kids on payroll at 7,500 a year, but they're also earning from their full-time jobs? The answer to that question is, if their income is over um, $12,550, then they're gonna have to pay tax at their rate. But here's the deal. Let's say you have a child that's earning, I don't know, 40,000 a year in a full-time job, but you're in a 37% tax rate you're gonna get a bigger deduction. Say you get a 37% deduction for, and, and, and maybe 10% state. So call it you know 47%, but your son or daughter is only gonna be at a 25% tax rate. What you might consider doing is doing this, having them pay the tax, maybe you reimburse them for that additional tax, or if they get to keep the money, they pay the tax at their rate, it's still money in their pocket and the family is ahead. That's kind of how you would have to do this. It also depends on the relationship you have with your son or daughter, right? So anyway, uh, Mel, thank you so much for the great information. You are always on top of things. Uh, I love bantering back and forth with you folks. 
Uh, Stacy, can you go back to our two contact informations at the beginning? Is that doable? Um, no. Wow, Stacy. Stacy is as as our entire team at I Bailey is just just remarkable. Here's our contact information. If you guys have any uh, issues, um, I would say you know if, if you need some help on your tax planning, you're not an I Bailey client. Send me an email. Give me a call. We can see what we can do to help you. Uh, I would contact Mel through email if you have any questions about this pending legislation. But um, we are very thankful that you joined the webinar today. Tell your friends, by the way, if they couldn't make it today, that this is going to be on demand on our uh, I Bailey um, YouTube page. Mel, any final comments before we let everybody get back to the rest of their day? You know, just uh, just keep an eye on things. And yeah. uh, certainly we will do our best. And, uh, you know, hopefully we will not be recording this, uh, as I say, at halftime of the Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be. Good luck with that. All right, folks, uh, for them, this is Mel Schwartz and Art Wiederman signing off for today. Be sure to join us on January 21st for our HHS Provider Relief Fund webinar. And thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone.